Okay, this is an interview with uh, Mr. Edmund R. Chappell, uh, who lives at Lake Havasa, Havasu. Arizona. And my name is Chris Connie Bear, conducting the interview, and, uh, and Mark Tanaka Sanders is assisting. And it's about 10.30 on December 2nd, 1986. Uh, Mr. Chappell, uh, what, was, what was your name and rank on December 7th, 1941? My name was Edmund R. Chappell. I was a seaman second class aboard the USS Maryland battleship BB-46. And uh, mm -hmm. how did you happen to be in Hawaii at that particular date? Had the Maryland been in, uh, been in port for long, or how did, how, did, how did you get here? Yes, we were on maneuvers prior to December 7th, and uh, we came into port along with the other ships prior to December 7th. Do you remember when you came into port? About Not exactly, no. It was uh, around the 1st of the, um, December, I believe. So you had just gotten back into yes, port? Yes. Uh -huh. Had you been to Hawaii before that? Or? No. Where were, your, where were you based? Uh, where was the Maryland base before you came to? Well, when I went aboard to Maryland, it was in uh, Bremerton, Washington, in Dry Dock in August of uh, 41. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was assigned to the 2nd Division, uh, eventually assigned to mess cooking duty. That's an important job. I was in, oh, that was a very important job. <laughs> I was in the Navy myself. I always appreciated those, those folks. Uh, so actually, that was your first, first time to Hawaii was in December of 41? Right. Mm -hmm. Had you had much experience in Hawaii at all? Had you been off the ship at all? For oh, we'd been years? ashore, yes, yeah. up and down the beaches. and. Uh, as a 17-year-old kid, we were not permitted in bars in those days, so naturally we were confined to the beach area. That was your main recreation? That was our recreation. What was, uh, and I, on December 7th, your job was uh, uh, cooking, or? Yes, I was mess cooking then. And uh, if I may define mess cooking in those days, it was, uh, each mess cook was assigned um, to 20 men, uh, 10 men at each table. And uh, you would go up to the galley and get the prepared food and serve these 20 men. And you were responsible for the dishes, the silverware, etc. And then if, were, if any were broken, then uh, that was deducted from your pay number. So it was very important to us who were making $21 a month to keep very good track of our dishes so that none were broken. And uh, that morning you were, what time would you get up to get start this routine? What? As I recall, I think we had to get up um, probably 5 o'clock or thereabouts in uh, preparation for the breakfast meal. And we had to go to the galley and bring coffee down prior to the main breakfast, which entailed uh, setting up tables and so forth. When did you first realize you were under attack? How did that realization happen? What, what happened? We had just finished breakfast, and uh, we were hurrying up and to get our dishes and the tables put away because uh, we were, uh, I was assigned to a uh, rowboat race that day. I think we were racing against uh, the Oklahoma and the California, as I recall. And sports in those days was uh, uh, quite, uh, oh, how shall I say, uh, quite important to all the crews. And uh, as we were putting our dishes away and the tables, someone aboard the uh, top side of the Maryland hollered that the Army was dropping sandbags, practicing. So, of course, we all ran on topside to observe this. And uh, about that time, a um, torpedo plane had um, apparently dropped a torpedo across the harbor and was pulling out of his dive. And uh, as he went over us, he strafed. He was so close that um, I saw the, the pilot very vividly. And uh, had I had a rock, I could perhaps hit him with it. But uh, as he went over us, he strafed us, and uh, I can still recall the deck being chipped up alongside of us, and uh, 
we all made a dive for this hatch to get back down where we came from. And about that time, general quarter sounded. What, what, the, what did the plane look like? Do you remember what color it was, what markings it had? It seems to me it was a silver. It had the rising sun underneath each wing. And, uh, oh, I don't recall. I couldn't describe the plane, that type of plane. Yeah. But um, as I remember, it was a torpedo plane. And did you make it down that hatch? Or? Oh, yes. <laughs> About 50 of us all together. <laughs> what happened next? Well, general quarters were sounded, and uh, my battle station at that time was in the lower handling room of a 16-inch turret in the second in turret two. And uh, we were there a short while, and uh, they decided they did not need us down there, and we were a short crew because a lot of them were on liberty. So they brought us up out of the turret, and we were assigned to the uh, five-inch 38 and aircraft guns. And uh, I was uh, handling ammunition on one of these five-inch 38s. And is that what you did through the, what, how long did the attack? Oh, through both, uh, both attacks, I was assigned there. Did you have any success? Did you hit anything? Not that I recall. Yeah. We made a lot of, a lot of noise. What, uh, when you first realized this was going on, when you tried to make that dive for that hatch, what kind of thoughts were going through your head? What were you thinking? <laughs> well, I probably thought that this 17-year-old kid would never get back to Colorado. <laughs> I thought this was the end. And um, as I've said many times, I was 17 going on 80. <laughs> that day. <clears throat> yes. Right after the attack, what kinds of things? What happened to the ship? Maybe you should explain what happened. It, you took a, a bad hit at some point. Yes, we got hit in the, um, uh, we had a bomb in the bow, and um, I think it killed six men up in that area. And um, as I recall, when that bomb exploded, it uh, sort of lifted the whole ship up in the air and just shook it violently and then dropped it suddenly. And it's an experience that one would never forget. And um, I did not see the Oklahoma capsize to our left side, but uh, the word was passed that it had capsized. And I heard the Arizona uh, explode and consequently sank. But you were inside the gun turret, so you couldn't... No, not at that time. No. We were not inside the gun turret. We were outside handling ammunition on the um, 538s. So you, could, you actually could observe some of the things that were going on. Did you see any uh, ships underway or any no, of those kinds no, of No, no, we didn't have time to, to watch that. Yeah, you just had to concentrate on right. passing ammunition. Mm -hmm. uh, when, after the attack subsided, what kind of duties did, did you end up doing? Well, I went back down to uh, my division. Uh, we were all told to go back to our uh, divisions, and uh, we would be assigned from there on. And all my dishes were broken, all the pieces. And that was my biggest worry at that time. And I couldn't do that. My thought was then, how in the hell am I going to pay for all these dishes on $21 a month? <laughs> um, well, naturally, I didn't have to. Those are the kinds of things, though, that you find sort of in Congress. You can't quite make the shift from... Right. Right? And that was uh, one of my biggest worries. Uh, I was not injured, and uh, I didn't have that worry. But there were a lot of injuries on the ship and uh, some fatalities. And uh, you got involved then with the, uh, some of the salvage operation with, uh, uh, with the Oklahoma, is that right? Or? Yes, the next day, well, I might back up. That night we were assigned uh, uh, rifles to guard the perimeter of the ship at arm's length because we had had word that the Japanese had landed at Diamond Head and were probably going to board the ships. So. Sometime during the night, we were assigned 
with loaded rifles uh, to surround the ship. And I was assigned um, on the uh, starboard side next to the Oklahoma for, it seemed like an eternity then. And we could hear the, those aboard the Oklahoma that were entrapped, we could hear them tapping on the hull and uh, uh, letting us know that they were there. And there were many uh, survivors who were being pulled out of the water at that time, um, out of the oil and burning oil. The next morning I was assigned to uh, a working party to go on the Oklahoma on the side to assist the yard workmen in cutting holes in the uh, bottom of it to, in a parent, uh, to retrieve some of the wounded and uh, survivors from the Oklahoma. Did you get, did you, were you successful? We were successful and I don't know how many we did retrieve who were not injured and there were some who had been injured severely and um, a strange coincidence, um, I had met a fellow off the Oklahoma which Life magazine had done a story on him some many years ago, a fellow by the name of Bob West and uh, at that time he lived in West Covina, California. I looked him up and uh, asked him um, if he remembered what time he was pulled out of the bottom of the Oklahoma. And he says, I remember exactly because they were sounding um, reveille. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it was sounding um, taps. Um, Sorry, go raising the flag, that's right. Okay. okay. I'm kind of vivid here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's okay, just uh, relax. Anyhow, he said, I remember it distinctly because they were sounding this bugle call. And I said, well, I was one of the workmen that helped pull